Australia is in the middle of building one of its biggest ever infrastructure projects, a freight railway almost 1,600 kilometers, about 990 miles long, stretching from Melbourne to Brisbane. It cuts through farmland, mountains, and floodplains, creating a direct inland corridor that bypasses the crowded East Coast. This project is not about shiny new passenger trains or luxury travel. It's about moving goods and moving them at a scale we've never seen before. The trains designed for inland rail will be nearly two kilometers long, stacked two containers high, and each one will haul the same load as more than 100 B-double trucks. That sounds impressive, but the bigger question is, why spend tens of billions of dollars on this, and will it actually work? Freight doesn't usually grab headlines, but it touches every part of daily life. The coffee you drink, the phone in your pocket, the clothes in your wardrobe, none of it just appears on the shelf. It all has to be transported from farms, factories, and ports across a country that's roughly the size of the continental United States, but with only a fraction of the population. But to see why this matters, we need to look at Australia's freight challenge more closely and why the current system is struggling to keep up. Australia's freight task is massive, and it's only getting bigger. On the East Coast, where most of the population lives, the amount of freight being moved every year is expected to double by 2030 to around 8 billion tons. That includes everything from grain and coal to supermarket stock and building materials. Right now, about three quarters of that freight travels by road, carried by endless convoys of semis along highways like the Hume, the Pacific, and the Newell. If you've ever driven those roads, you'll know what that looks like. Streams of heavy vehicles, kilometer after kilometer, day and night. There are a few big problems with that. First, safety. Heavy trucks make up only a small percentage of vehicles on the road, but they're involved in a much higher percentage of serious crashes. The more trucks we put on highways, the higher the risk. Second, congestion. Those trucks don't just use rural highways, they also snake into cities to make deliveries. That adds to traffic, slows everyone else down, and costs businesses time and money. Third, maintenance. Roads simply weren't built for this kind of constant pounding. A fully loaded B-double truck can do the same road damage as hundreds of cars. More trucks mean higher maintenance bills for governments, which ultimately means higher costs for taxpayers. So why not shift more freight to rail? Well, that's where the second half of the problem comes in. The existing rail network between Melbourne and Brisbane is old, slow, and doesn't really compete with road freight. Trains have to travel a long coastal route and squeeze through Sydney, where they run into two big issues, congestion and curfews. Passenger trains get priority through the city, so freight often has to wait its turn. There are strict curfews that prevent freight from running during the morning and evening rush hours. Add in winding track and outdated infrastructure, and what you get is a freight train that can take more than 32 hours to complete the journey. That's not much faster, and sometimes slower, than a long-haul truck. And when you're a business trying to move fresh produce or time-sensitive cargo, speed and reliability matter. If rail can't deliver on both, companies will stick with trucks. That's why rail's share of the East Coast freight market has been sliding for years. Now put all of this together, freight volumes doubling, roads already crowded, rail too slow to compete. You can see the problem. Without a new solution, the next decade could mean more trucks, more accidents, more highway congestion, and much higher costs for keeping the roads in working order. That's the gap Inland Rail is designed to fill. It's not just a new piece of infrastructure. It's meant to be a dedicated freight corridor, built to handle tomorrow's demand while taking the pressure off today's road and rail systems. However, the idea of a direct inland freight railway between Melbourne and Brisbane is not new. In fact, it's been on the table for more than a century. As far back as 1915, Australian leaders floated proposals for an inland route through towns like Parks and Moray to bypass the slow coastal line. But with the First World War underway, the plan was shelved. The idea never completely disappeared. In the 1940s, during World War II, military planners once again raised the inland route as a way to move troops and supplies more efficiently, but nothing came of it. In the decades that followed, the project would surface in reports and then vanish again, usually sidelined by cost or shifting political priorities. By the 1990s, freight demand was rising quickly and industry groups started lobbying harder. 
In 1996, the Keating government commissioned a study into a possible inland corridor. The work was later picked up under Prime Minister John Howard, but again it stopped short of becoming reality. Momentum started to build in the 2000s. In 2006, then-Deputy Prime Minister Mark Vale from the National Party publicly called Inland Rail a nation-building priority, warning that highways alone couldn't handle the growing freight load. That helped push the project back into the national spotlight. A turning point came in 2010, when the Gillard government directed the Australian Rail Track Corporation ARTC, to carry out a full feasibility study. That study was completed in 2015, during Tony Abbott's time as Prime Minister, and it confirmed what had long been suspected. A direct inland line would cut transit times and costs significantly, and it was worth pursuing. The real breakthrough came in 2017. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce announced a formal commitment of about $8.4 billion in government funding. Barnaby Joyce, in particular, was one of the loudest champions, selling inland rail as a project that would transform regional towns along the route. So what exactly is inland rail? At its core, it's a freight railway stretching nearly 1,600 kilometers from Melbourne to Brisbane. The crucial detail is the route. Instead of hugging the crowded east coast and winding through Sydney, it cuts inland through regional Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland. The design is very different from the old line. This is not about patching up existing track with small improvements. Inland rail is built specifically for modern, high-capacity freight. That means longer trains, taller loads, and faster speeds. The trains planned for the line will be up to 1.8 kilometers long, almost the length of 18 football fields end-to-end. -end. And unlike the current system, inland rail is being built to carry double-stacked containers, two containers on each wagon, one on top of the other. It might sound like a small change, but it's a huge leap in efficiency. Now, how do you actually build a railway like this? About 1,000 kilometers of the inland rail route comes from upgrading existing lines. Crews are raising bridges, widening tunnels, and strengthening the track so it can handle taller, heavier trains. The remaining 600 kilometers will be completely new track, laid across paddocks, plains, and mountain foothills to link it all together. When the project was first pitched, the figure was about $8.4 billion. That number has since gone up dramatically. We'll get to that later. But even at its original price tag, it was one of the biggest infrastructure projects Australia had ever attempted. Construction began in 2018, with the first section completed in 2020 between Parks and Narromine in New South Wales. That stretch is already in use by freight trains, giving a taste of what the finished network will look like. The full project, though, is still years away from completion. The big idea behind Inland Rail is simple. By bypassing Sydney, straightening the route, and building infrastructure to modern standards, trains will finally be able to compete head-to-head -head with long-haul trucking. And the target is clear. Move freight from Melbourne to Brisbane in less than 24 hours. But Inland Rail is not only about connecting Melbourne and Brisbane. Along the way, it threads through dozens of regional towns that have often been bypassed by big infrastructure projects. For many of those communities, this railway is more than just steel and sleepers. It's a new economic lifeline. Take Parks in central New South Wales. It already sits at the crossroads of Australia's east-west and north-south freight lines. With inland rail coming through, Parks is being transformed into a major logistics hub. Warehouses are expanding, new freight terminals are under construction, and the town is positioning itself as the beating heart of the inland freight network. It's not just Parks. Towns like Mori and Toowoomba are also being lined up as freight centers. That means more than trains passing through. It means jobs in distribution, warehousing, and support industries. Local businesses supplying everything from fuel to catering are already seeing the benefits during construction. Speaking of construction, the project itself is creating a wave of employment. Estimates put it at around 16,000 jobs during the build. That's engineers, machine operators, surveyors, and contractors spread across three states. And the government has pushed for much of the spending to go local, with regional suppliers providing materials and services worth hundreds of millions of dollars. 
Once the line is operational, there will be ongoing roles too, maintaining tracks, operating freight terminals, and running the massive trains themselves. These aren't short-term opportunities, they're the kind of jobs that anchor families in regional towns. The wider economy stands to benefit as well. Inland rail is projected to add about $16 billion to Australia's GDP over the next 50 years. Take agriculture as an example. A grain grower in western New South Wales might currently send crops by truck to Newcastle or Sydney. With inland rail, they'll have faster access to Brisbane's port as well, giving them more options and better prices. That kind of efficiency can lift entire sectors. And when exports become more competitive, the benefits flow back to the national economy. It means stronger trade balances, more resilient supply chains, and ultimately lower prices for consumers. So while inland rail is often described as a freight line, it's really more than that. It's a regional development project and an economic project wrapped into one. And for towns that have long felt overlooked, it represents a rare chance to become central players in Australia's freight future. But for all the benefits Inland Rail promises, the project has been dogged by problems. Some are about money, some about time, and others about trust with the very communities the railway is meant to serve. Let's start with cost. When it was first announced, the government pitched it as an $8.4 billion project. That was ambitious, but still within the range of what a mega project might reasonably cost. Fast forward a few years, and independent reviews now put the final bill at more than $31 billion, triple the original figure. That's one of the biggest cost blowouts in Australian infrastructure history. Critics say the early estimates were unrealistic from the start, while others blame poor planning and weak oversight. Whatever the reason, taxpayers are footing a much bigger bill than they were first told. Then there's the timeline. It was once expected to be complete by the mid-2020s. That deadline has long since disappeared. Construction began in 2018, and while one section is open, the rest has been delayed. The latest plans suggest the southern half, from Melbourne to Parks, might be finished around 2027. But the full Melbourne to Brisbane link is unlikely to run before 2030 or 2031. For a project billed as urgent and essential, a decade of delays has raised questions about whether the benefits will arrive too late. But perhaps the thorniest issues are about the route itself. In Queensland, the railway is set to cross the Kandamine floodplain, an area notorious for heavy flooding. Farmers and local councils have warned that embankments and raised tracks could alter natural water flows, making floods worse and putting lives at risk. Some landholders have mounted fierce opposition, arguing their properties will be cut in half by the track and their livelihoods put on the line. In New South Wales, Aboriginal land councils have raised concerns about the line running through culturally significant areas like the Paliga Forest. They've accused project managers of failing to properly consult traditional owners and ignoring heritage protections. For them, the issue is not just about freight efficiency, it's about respect for country and community. The controversies haven't stopped the project, but they've slowed it down and reshaped how it's managed. To try and keep things under control, the government created a dedicated inland rail entity, Inland Rail Proprietary Limited, to manage delivery, replacing the previous structure under ARTC. The hope is that tighter governance and clearer accountability will prevent more cost blowouts and delays. And that brings us to where things stand now. A project that's partly built, heavily delayed, and still under fierce debate, but moving forward nonetheless. For now, it remains both a promise and a work in progress. A promise of faster freight, safer roads, and stronger regional economies, and a work in progress that still has to prove it can deliver. So what do you think? Is inland rail worth the billions being spent, or should Australia have invested in something else? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching and see you soon in the next one.